start today by, by remembering. When I was in college, the best week of the year was finals week. Now, always true. Finals week was great because it meant there was no class, there was no chapel, and uh, there were no activities. It was just you studied, you went and took the test, and you got out of there. It was wonderful. There was nothing else going on. With the exception of one night and in the spring semester, the eve before the first day of finals, they had a midnight breakfast at the dining hall. And it was great. And you know me. I love eating. And it was great because you'd go and you know, pancakes and, and waffles and, and French toast and, and all sorts of eggs, sausage and bacon and every kind of cereal you can imagine. And what else? We had juice. We had milk. Uh, you know, chocolate milk. You know, all this stuff at midnight. You know, and it was great. But it wasn't the best thing about the breakfast. The best thing about the breakfast was that all the food and uh, all the stuff that was there, it was prepared and served by our professors. It was our professors. So you'd go in where you're used to seeing a student worker there behind the grid or, or behind the food counter. It was, it was one of your professors. Uh, they, they, it was great because they, they didn't pay to be there. They, they just did it. They took time out of their sleep schedules to just come serve us at midnight. And I thought it was great. And I remember sitting with my friends at one of these breakfast ones, and I was kind of a, a little bit sad because I said, it's so great of them to do this for us. But it's a, this late this semester, we don't have any way of publicly thanking the, these professors for what they do. You know, as uh, one of the editors of the school newspaper, I thought, wouldn't it be great if we could print a public thank you to them? But we couldn't because we were done publishing. So I, I, I said this, it's just too bad we can't do anything for them for doing this. And, and my friend looked at me, and my friend said, you know, you're right. But isn't that what it means to be a servant? just serve, and you don't get anything in return for it. My friend said, you know, these professors, they come out, and they, they give us this breakfast. They provide this for us to thank us in appreciation, out of gratitude, for all the work we've put in to their classes this semester. You know, it was just an off-the-cuff conversation that happened spontaneously. But I still remember to this day, years later, as being one of the greatest lessons I ever received on Christian service. Because it honed right in on the nature, the heart of why we serve who we serve, and what we expect out of it. You know, today, we come to a short passage of Scripture that does that same thing. It's just a short story thrown in there, and it's a passage we often overlook in our hurry to get to other more involved stories in Matthew's Gospel. But it's here. And it's in Matthew 8, verses 14 and 15, where it says, When Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law in bed with a fever. He touched her hand, and the fever left her. But she got up and began to wait on him. You know, in the service, there's not much to that story, is there? But I think if we look at it more deeply, we see how much it reveals, how much it reveals about our response to the grace of Jesus Christ and why we serve Him in this lifetime. Let us pray. Dear God, I, I pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our strength and our redeeming. You know, as I said, there's not a whole lot to the story. But we see Jesus. He's traveling around. He's got these guys following him, learning from him. They're his students. We know them as disciples. And one of the disciples is very familiar. It's, it's Peter, Simon Peter, who after Jesus rises from the dead and is ascended in heaven, Peter will be the one to lead the church in its infancy. We know Peter. But at this point, Peter, he's just brand new. He's just newly following Jesus. He's just a fisherman trying to figure out who this Jesus is, what he's about. And, and, and so uh, Jesus comes to Peter's house. Now, we're not told why Jesus came to stay at Peter's house. Well, it's not far-fetched to, to believe that Peter would invite his rabbi, Jesus, his teacher, to come and stay a night or a few nights at his home. And so they're there. Jesus arrives. And when they arrive, there's something that happening at the house that might be a little bit embarrassing in that day. You know? Peter's mother-in-law, <laughs> she's sick in bed with fever. He's like, well, why is that embarrassing? Well, because in that day, in that culture, it was expected that the women of the house would offer hospitality to people as they came to visit. And, and being sick, Peter's mother-in-law could not do that. So it was probably a little bit awkward for everyone involved. But, but Jesus, he's great. He's not like the other spiritual leaders of the day. He comes in and talks about how insulting this is, that this woman's not observing him. Or he's not there going on and on about how the women of the house should be serving his every whim because he's a special guest. No, that's, that's not the Jesus. Jesus, instead, he simply goes to the bed of Peter's mother-in-law. He touches her hand, and he removes the fever. He heals her. Now, this isn't the first place in Matthew's Gospel we see Jesus healing people. In fact, up to this point, up to chapter 8, we see Jesus out healing people of all sorts of conditions, all sorts of illnesses. We see him 
uh, delivering people from problems uh, with seizures. In chapter 8 alone, before we get up to this point, Jesus finds a man with leprosy, and Jamie told us what leprosy was earlier, and Jesus heals him. And then Jesus has the centurion, this Roman centurion, a leader of a bunch of Roman soldiers, comes up to him and says, Jesus, my servant is sick and suffering. And Jesus doesn't even go to the servant. He just says, all right, your servant's healed. And from a distance, Jesus heals the servant. And so we see Jesus doing all these healings. And in most cases, they're serious, sometimes life-threatening things that are going on here that Jesus heals these people of. But all Peter's mother-in-law is suffering from is a fever. Certainly in that day and age, it could be dangerous. But compared to everything else, it's a minor thing. But Jesus heals her. He touches her. He touches the sick woman, which in that culture, again, a religious person was never allowed to touch a sick woman. But Jesus does it. He doesn't care. He touches her, and she is healed. Now, not only is her fever taken away, but her energy is, comes back. You know when you get a fever, sometimes your fever will break, but you're kind of dead to the world, aren't you? You just, you can't move, you have no energy. But this woman, not only does her fever go away, her energy's back, and we know this because she immediately gets up, and, and she starts to wait on Jesus. Jesus heals her, and then she serves him. Now certainly, it, even though it was customary for the woman to offer hospitality in this culture, certainly the people would have understood if she didn't. I mean, after all, she had just been sick, she had been recovering, she kind of had a pass on this one. But Peter's mother law she doesn't care about that, she gets up, and she serves Jesus. Why? We're not told. I can only imagine it's out of gratitude. Gratitude for this uh, healing he has brought to her life. And I tell you, that woman, she demonstrates for us something that should be happening over and over again in the lives of everybody in this world who follows Jesus. Because if you're a follower of Jesus, you have realized somewhere along the way that you need healing. Now, I'm not talking about healing of a medical condition. I'm talking about healing of your spirit and your soul. We all encounter that need for that type of healing in our lives because we're all there. We are all sick. We were created to worship God and to be in God's presence. And when we're away from God, well, we're sick. Life, it's not complete. It's like you try to live without oxygen. You ever try to do that? You ever uh, get cut, your air cut off? You eventually start to suffocate when you don't have oxygen. You know, when I was uh, teaching CPR for the Red Cross, we used to tell people, and you have between six and eight minutes, usually, uh, by the time that person's heart stops, pop, stops pumping blood and getting oxygen to the brain, you have six to eight minutes before the brain starts to experience permanent damage from not having any oxygen. So while the person's laying on the ground, you see them at minute two and minute ten, they might look the same, but they're not the same at minute ten because they're, they're dying. They're slowly, their brain is suffocating. And that's what happens in our lives when we try to live without God. You know, we might uh, not see it in ourselves. We not, might not see it in others. We might not even feel it inside. But all along, we are dying. We're dying because we have made the decisions in our lives that take us out of the will of God. They separate us from God. And that right relationship with God, that thing we were made for, it's not there. We're trapped by our illness. And we're trapped. All we want is to be freed from this sickness. The sickness brought on by our decisions, but we're trapped there. Even the best of us have messed up so much to the point where we're in that trap. You know, that, that close relationship with God is out of which free. We are all dying. And this is when Jesus, he comes and he steps into our lives. In the same way he stepped into the lives, uh, the life of Peter's mother-in-law. He comes to us, and he doesn't care how sick we are. He doesn't care how much we've done wrong or haven't done wrong. He doesn't care if everybody else out in the world says, well, that person has, has no business seeking the help of Jesus, or who does that person think they are? No, Jesus doesn't care. He comes into our lives, and he touches us where we hurt, where we are suffering. And he tells us, you know what? I died to take away that hurt. I died to take away that guilt. I died to take away that death brought on by your wrong decisions. He says, trust me, I can give you something more. I can heal you. And when we allow Jesus in our lives, when we make that decision to follow him, we allow ourselves to trust him, we are healed. We get that healing. You see, the great thing about Jesus, though, is that he does come, and he does heal us when we follow him. He does heal us of that stuff that separates us from God. He gives us that right relationship with God, but then he keeps coming back. He keeps coming and healing us over and over again. 
those things from our past that hold us back, that cause dysfunction, that make us feel guilty, that, that, that um, cause us pain and regret when we look back. When Jesus comes into our life, and every day he's working to heal us, to, to take those things and make them better in our lives. He heals us in that place. You know, time after time, when we live in right relationship with God, Jesus comes to heal those broken things in us. You know, sometimes we give something to Jesus, we follow Jesus, we give our lives to Jesus, and we follow him, and uh, we feel that freedom from those things right away. There are just some things that have held us back in our past, and right away we see, ah, oh, Jesus has healed me there. I understand now. I have the love of God in my life, and I'm held of it. Sometimes it's a harder process. Jesus heals us through a time, a time when we learn to give those things to him, give those harmful things to Jesus so he can come and heal us of them. See, the final truth is that Jesus comes into our lives and he heals us to bring us relationship with God. And then he keeps coming back and healing us, healing those other things in our lives. And it's all Jesus. It's nothing we do. We're like Peter's mother-in-law. She's there, she has a feeder. Nothing she does heals her. It's what Jesus comes and does. You know, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 says, uh, we are, are healed by the grace of Jesus Christ. It is by grace we are healed and saved. It's nothing we do. It's a gift of God. We can't do it. You know, it reminds me, during the Spanish-American War, uh, then Colonel Theodore Roosevelt, he came to Claire Barton at the Red Cross, and he wanted to buy some supplies to, to help his sick and injured men. And, and his request was denied. And he was distraught. Roosevelt said, what am I going to do? I, I need these things to help my sick men. And Claire Barton just looked at me and she said, Colonel, all you have to do is ask. He said, oh. He got it. He said, well, then I ask for these supplies. Because he received from grace what he couldn't buy, what he couldn't purchase or, or, or deal for. That's the grace of God in our lives. That's the healing that Jesus brings. It can't be bought. It can't be purchased. It can't be bartered for. Jesus sees our sickness. He sees our separation from God. And he comes and he brings us his healing. He brings us healing he brings us health, and he brings us purpose. You know, in a physical sense, Jesus did that same thing for Peter's mother-in-law. She is a physical example of what Jesus does in the life, the spiritual life of anyone who comes and follows Jesus. Jesus touched Peter's mother-in-law. He brought her healing, he brought her health, and he brought her purpose. And Jesus will do it for anyone who seeks after him. That's not the end of the story, is it? The story goes that the woman is healed... And she gets up and waits on Jesus. The woman's response, she has a response to Jesus' healing. Serving Jesus. You know what? When we allow the healing of Jesus Christ into our lives, we should have a response to it too. Serving Jesus. If you're someone who says, I'm a follower of Jesus, and you're not out there looking for ways to serve Jesus every day, well, you don't get it. You've missed half of it. Jesus healed you. And then we serve him. We don't serve to buy salvation. Don't get me wrong. We don't serve to earn points with Jesus. We don't serve to get things our own way or, or because we're going to get something out of it. No. No. None of that works with God. You can try it with God, but he, He's not going to do it. We serve as a response to what Jesus has already done in our lives. He has brought us freedom. And he has brought us in to that right relationship with God. That alone is our motivator. It's gratitude. Out of gratitude. We serve Jesus. And we look around to this truth of what Jesus brings healing to everyone who comes after him. He heals us of our sins. He heals us of the things that hold us back in life. And we have a response to it. You know, as I thought about it this week, I, I, I saw three responses that we usually see in the church. Sadly, the first two that I'm going to talk about, they're inappropriate. The first response, well, it's those people who really have no response at all. These are people who come to Jesus Christ for his grace, for his healing in their life. And, and, and then afterward, there's no sermon. There's no gratitude. These, you know, you find them in every church. Uh, these people who, they might be there every Sunday. But um, when it comes to joining the congregation in the church's mission, in the church's ministry, well, they're not there. And uh, the people in their lives that they love, their family, their friends, their neighbors, the stuff going on in their lives, well, that's their stuff. Why would they worry about that? It never occurs to them that by serving these other people, they can serve Jesus. And let's face it, these people really don't care about that anyway. That's the first response. Probably the saddest response. The second response that we get is service with a catch. 
Service with the cash. This is service that really has things a little bit backward. It's service with an ulterior motive. And it kind of reminds me of this. There's this pastor in a church one Sunday, and he came to the people, and he said, you know, we're in a place where some things happened this week, and we need some money to, to cover it, but we don't have it. So I want you to prayerfully consider giving a little bit more this, this week. And he said, as we pass the plate, I'll make you a deal. Whoever puts the most in it, it will be able to name our three hymns that we're going to sing in our service this, this Sunday. So they pass the plate, and the pastor gets, gets it back, and he sees right on top a $1,000 bill. And he says, oh, well, who gave this? And after uh, cajoling the crowd a little bit, uh, he finally gets a single little woman back to raise her hand and admit, you know, embarrassed him. You know, I, I, I gave that. So he says, well, come on up and choose our hymns. And she's all excited. She gets up front, and she, she points to the three most handsome men in the congregation. She says, I'll take him and him. <laughs> But what is it? That's, that's giving us service to God with a motive, isn't it? That's what it is. It's service that says, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll serve if I get something for it. I'll serve if you recognize me in front of the whole congregation and fawn all over me. Sure, we'll serve. Uh, this church will be all about the mission of Jesus Christ and what he calls us to do so long as, you know, it turns out having more people in the pews at our designated time on Sunday morning, uh, as long as those people are coming and they're putting money in the offering plate, we'll serve, sure. No, but that's not service to Jesus. That, that's, that's bargaining. And the third response is gratitude. It's gratitude. It's coming to Jesus saying, yes, Jesus, I will serve you because I am so in love with you for everything you have done for me. It's saying to Jesus, Jesus, show me every day new ways that I can come and I can do something for you. I can serve you. Show me the people I can serve and love them so I can love you. <sighs> because I just can't thank you enough. It's coming to Jesus saying, yes, Jesus, I'll do those things in your kingdom that nobody else wants to do. Because you gave me that right relationship with God, the most important thing in this universe. You know, that's the heart of Peter's mother-in-law. That's the heart of a true servant. You know, that, that heart that comes out of gratitude for Jesus Christ. So when we talk about gratitude and service this morning, where are you there? You know, maybe you're someone here today who has never made that decision to follow Jesus. And so you've never experienced that healing in your life, that freedom from your past, your guilt that Jesus can take away when you follow him. If that is you, won't you come in today? Won't you let him in today and experience the right relationship that Jesus can bring you with God? Won't you talk to me today before you leave this place about how you can experience that healing relationship with Jesus? You know, or maybe you're someone who was there, and maybe you got a little bit mad when I was talking about the first response, when I said these are people who don't really care. Maybe that's because, maybe, well, maybe you're, maybe that's you, and you just don't want to admit it. You know, it's, it's time to change that. Time to offer Jesus the gratitude that he deserves for what he has already done in your life. Not even to mention the fact that he's just the creator of everything around us. Time to start looking for that way, those ways in our community and in our church to start serving Jesus. Maybe you're one of those people who are out there bargaining. And, you know, maybe as you consider your life right now, you heard my words, you, you're seeing some evidence in your life, and, oh, that's kind of what I'm doing. I'm expecting something from Jesus out of what I'm doing for him. Won't you stop today to consider the healing he has already given you? What he has already given you, he's opened heaven wide open for you. Won't you make that that, that a decision today, that your service from here on in, it's not going to be to get something else out of it. But it's going to be out of pure gratitude to our Lord Jesus Christ. Finally, maybe you're one of those people who is already in your life going to God every day saying, Jesus, show me. Show me how I can serve you. Help me to serve you better. If that's you, well, maybe you should be a pastor because you're further ahead than most of us. And I, I tell you today, you know, stay at it. I encourage you. Stay at it because you are an encouragement to the rest of us to serve our Lord Jesus Christ in a greater way. And may God bless you.